Just why is modern life so stressful? Now that's a question that lots of people ask, and it seems to be a question that gets asked more and more often. Now, before I answer it, let's just take a look at a typical day for the average person. You get up before it's light. You've got to get your family up and fed, and your kids off to school, and then you've got to get yourself to work. Perhaps you have a long drive in heavy traffic, or you have to deal with overcrowded public transport. Either way, you arrive at work tired and in need of that first cup of coffee—coffee, coffee which of course is a stimulant which raises stress levels. And if you're like most people, your working day probably involves staring at a computer screen under artificial light. Lunch is probably something high in fat and sugar. And is eaten al desco. Work probably requires your complete concentration, and is likely interrupted by phone calls, conversations with co-workers, dealing with things that are going wrong, etc., etc., all up against a tight deadline. The journey home is a repeat of your journey in. Perhaps after work you go for a workout at the gym because you feel you're not getting enough exercise. Or maybe you have to cook dinner for your family. Then there's all the other stuff that you had to do at home. You know, the laundry and the cleaning and helping the kids with their homework and getting them to bed and that sort of thing. And then you crash in front of the TV and maybe you doze off and sleep for a couple of hours. But then you wake up and you're even more tired. So you simply fall into bed exhausted. After a fitful night's sleep. You get up the next day and do it all again, and the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, and so on. Well, no wonder you feel stressed. So exactly, what is stress? Well, stress is nature's way of dealing with our inbuilt fight or flight mechanism, and it all harks back to your inner caveman or your inner cave woman. Now, back then, if you were hunting a woolly mammoth or you were hunting a deer with just a spear and a bow and arrow, then you'd need plenty of energy to track it and to chase after it. Your senses would be heightened too, so that you could find it in the first place and anticipate where it was going to run. Likewise, if you were running to escape a saber-toothed tiger, well, you'd need plenty of energy, and you'd need to keep your wits about you too. Either way, the stress would be just for a short time only, and then you'd rest. Nowadays, though, we're on this heightened state of alert all the time. The unnatural ways we lead our lives, well, that doesn't help either. You need to learn how to program your mind so that the inner caveman part doesn't perceive everything as a hunting expedition or a threat. And it's not too hard to learn. And once you can do it, life. In this video, I want to give you an introduction to meditation because there are a lot of misconceptions about the subject. Now, many people have the wrong idea about meditation. They think it's all hippy dippy, you know, something people did in the 1960s, a new age way to achieve enlightenment or to recreate the effects of hallucinogenic drugs, you know, that sort of thing. Others associate it with religions, religions like Buddhism, for example. Well, it can be all of those things, but at its most basic, meditation means trying to control and focus your thoughts, or to clear your mind, or both. Essentially, it's the equivalent of training your attention. It's deciding what you want to concentrate on and what you don't. So it's, in a way, it's reprogramming your brain, reprogramming your natural computer to be more focused and more guided. Now, so often, our thoughts are reactive. 
we're constantly being distracted and taken from one experience to another. You know, whether that's due to television or to music or to your smartphone or to the internet or to something else entirely. You know, our thoughts are always all over the place. We hear something and we react to it. But when you meditate, you'll be effectively controlling your thoughts. And when you do this, you're going to become introspective and you'll start to reflect on the very nature of thought itself. And as you do, you'll learn to remain in control of your thoughts and to prevent yourself from becoming easily distracted, stressed, angry, or from otherwise experience inappropriate or unhelpful emotions. And this is a highly valuable form of training and one that's particularly relevant in today's fast paced and constantly connected world. You know, everything's just going on all the time. As I was saying just now, you know, the phone might ring in a minute and you'd have to answer it and something else might happen. And you know, you're constantly being bombarded. But Meditation, when you learn how to meditate, it can help us to conquer stress, to improve concentration in a range of tasks. You can really sort of drill down and focus your brain on whatever you want to focus on. Fortunately, meditation is starting to make its way into the mainstream. More and more productivity and lifestyle coaches are recommending its benefits and it forms an integral part of cognitive behavioral therapy, otherwise known as CBT. And this is currently the most popular form of clinical intervention for a whole host of psychological difficulties. So the question then becomes where to start? Well, let's look at some different types of meditation and some of the different terms. Now, bear in mind that you don't have to stick rigidly to any one of these and you can actually create your own kind of meditation if you wish. Nevertheless, any of these will provide you with a good starting point to do more of your own research and to start practicing the art of meditation. Okay, let's look at the different types of meditation. Now, the first one is mindfulness. Now, mindfulness, which is also called vipassana, is a type of meditation that comes from Buddhism. And it's also the form of meditation that's perhaps most widely used in the Western world today, and a good example of this being its use within CBT. Now, your goal in mindfulness is to be aware and to be present of your own thoughts and to reflect on them. And this form of meditation doesn't encourage you to try and empty your mind. Instead, the objective is simply to let your thoughts drift by like clouds in the sky. And this allows you to become more aware of what thoughts that you tend to have. And in so doing, you're better able to spot negative thought patterns and so on that might be causing problems. And this type of meditation has also been shown to reduce anxiety almost as effectively as anxiety reducing drugs. Perhaps the biggest advantage of mindfulness though is that it's not as challenging as trying to completely empty your mind of thoughts and so it provides a great starting point for those who are interested in learning more about meditation. Then there's Zazen. Now Zazen is a term that essentially means seated meditation. And it's sometimes referred to by the modern Zen tradition as just sitting. This is an incredibly minimalist sort of meditation, which once again makes it ideal for those interested in getting started by, you know, if you're feeling a little anxious about meditation, then you might want to give Zazen a go. Now, the most important thing about Zazen is assuming the correct sitting position or pose. And you want to be sitting like this guy on the right here. You want to be kneeling down with your legs tucked up underneath you. You want to keep your back and neck straight. You want to uh, have your hands lightly clasped and in your lap. You want to be sitting upright, keep your neck straight, keep your eyes closed and then just simply sit and let the thoughts come. 
And the simple act of sitting completely still is almost sure to result in a calming effect and to gradually clear your mind. So there's no need for complex instruction beyond just sitting. Now, for some people, the lack of guidance is going to make this an approachable and enjoyable form of meditation. For others, though, it can be frustrating and it might leave you lost. Then there's spiritual meditation. Now, spiritual meditation is essentially a form of meditative prayer, and prayer has been shown to have many similar effects to other forms of meditation. And it's used in all different types of religions, not just ones from the East. You know, if you're Catholic and you pray the Rosary, you know, saying those Hail Marys over and over again can be quite meditative and quite relaxing, and it clears your mind of. Everything else, because you're just concentrating on saying that same prayer over and over again. Then there's transcendental meditation. Now, transcendental meditation comes from Vedanta, which is the meditative tradition from Hinduism. And transcendental meditation is once again seated, and this time it uses a mantra. Now, a mantra is any word or sound of your choice, which is simply repeated over and over again, or you could simply concentrate on the sound of your breathing. That's another way to do transcendental meditation. The ultimate objective of transcendental meditation is transcendence, and this is the meditation that is used as the path to enlightenment, which is reportedly a feeling of oneness with the universe and perfect contentment. In reality, though, enlightenment is probably just a brain state achieved by relaxing areas of the brain and getting them to shut down. And this is something that takes years to master and is highly elusive. If you use transcendental meditation with the sole objective of reaching the state of mind, then I'm afraid you're likely to be disappointed. When done correctly, though, transcendental meditation is an ideal way to relax and move your thoughts away from stress. And it can be used to calm the heart rate, and is a fantastic coping mechanism if you suffer with anxiety. It's also quite difficult, though, and many people give up after becoming frustrated at the ability to quiet their inner voice. The secret to success then is to go easy on yourself and not to try and force it. Then we've got focused meditation. Now, as with transcendental or mantra meditation. Focused meditation involves the practice of trying to completely clear your thoughts by focusing on something else. Mantra meditation is one form of focused meditation, but you could alternatively try focusing on an external stimuli or even on something like a candle flame. That's always very good to try. Then there's guided visualization. Now, the guided part of this process involves listening to a recording, which will often describe the scene that you're in. This kind of meditation is great for relaxing and for moving your thoughts away from the hustle and bustle of daily life before you achieve the ability to block out your surroundings through other forms of meditation. Then there's movement meditation. And a great example of this is Tai Chi Chuan, which is a martial art practiced incredibly slowly, involving a set of gentle movements. While it takes time to learn something like a Tai Chi set, you can practice movement meditation by using a dance routine, or even by just swaying gently from side to side. Then there's Vipassana, and Vipassana is Theravada meditation. Theravada being a branch of Buddhism. This is meditation which involves close attention to sensation, with the goal being to discover the nature of existence. This form of meditation comes from Buddhism and was believed to be the type practiced by Buddha himself. Then there's Vajrayana. Vajrayana meditation is a complicated and advanced form of meditation, which involves the goal of becoming more Buddha-like. There are various types of meditation within Vajrayana, such as Mahamudra. This form of meditation involves attempts to empty the mind once again. This time by simply doing nothing to the extent that you aren't even focused on trying to meditate. Both the Theravada and Vajrayana forms of meditation are advanced methods and require years of practice to perfect. 
An understanding of the surrounding beliefs and the cultures is also helpful, as so you can you know, put everything into the right sort of context. You can also combine different types of meditation to suit your needs or the situation you may face. So, for example, you might decide to use Vajrayana meditation to psych yourself up for a competition or to prepare for an interview, and then use Theravada meditation to calm down afterwards or to chill out before bed. You can use mindfulness to help make difficult decisions by reflecting on your thoughts in a non-pressured manner or to help correct damaging thought patterns. And you can use transcendental meditation to give your brain a... In this video, I want to talk about how you can go about introducing mindfulness into your life. To introduce mindfulness into your life, set some time aside every morning to practice being mindful. Just five minutes at a time is all you really need. And just sit quietly away from any distractions. In fact, if you're someone who likes to have a hot bath in the morning, then doing this way in a nice warm bath, in a nice warm environment, then that's a great way to practice mindfulness. But either way, sit quietly away from distractions and just let your mind wander. You know, don't think of anything specific. You'll be surprised at what pops into your mind. Then you need to think about your thoughts. Why do you think that way? What do you hope for? How can it be achieved? What are you afraid of? Why are you afraid of it? And what can you do about it? Just let the thoughts drift through your mind while you're relaxing. Then, as you come out of your mindful state, start thinking about what you can do to conquer your fears work towards your goals, and so on. And these techniques are at the heart of cognitive behavioural therapy, and this is a very powerful psychological technique. So what is cognitive behavioural therapy, otherwise known as CBT? Well, CBT is a psychotherapeutic technique, and it's a technique used by psychologists when they're trying to treat patients with anxiety disorders or with mental illnesses. And it's a framework that has become very popular and is now the preferred method of treatment on the UK's NHS, that's our National Health Service, and many other health institutions. Now, there are two main reasons for this. First of all, CBT is much more effective than older methods like psychotherapy and it has been demonstrated to work in a number of studies. Secondly, CBT is quick, non-invasive, and it's cost-effective. It can even be used remotely simply by setting the patient homework to try and attempt on their own. OK, let's delve into a bit of history as to how all this came about. Behavioural psychology is an old school of psychology that was big in the 1950s. And the central tenet here was that all our behaviour and thought processes were learned through repetition, association and observation. And I suppose the best example of this is Pavlov's dog. Now, if you're not familiar with the uh, story, I'll just bring you up to speed. Pavlov was a psychologist and he had a dog and he noticed that when the dog saw his food he started to salivate. So Pavlov tried to get the dog to associate something else with the food and what he did was he rang a bell and at first of course the dog didn't take any notice. But then when he rang the bell at meal times and placed the food in front of the dog, the dog would start to salivate. And after a while of doing all of this, as soon as Pavlov rang the bell, the dog would think, ah, yes, it's dinner time, and he would start to salivate. And so in that way, Pavlov managed to get the dog to salivate just by ringing the bell. And so he formed the theory that the dog had learned to associate the ring of the bell with getting his food. And behaviourism attempted to explain every single aspect of our psychology this way. 
Phobias and other psychological problems were the result of unhelpful associations forming and these could be treated by creating new associations. Or as B.J. Neblett put it, we are the sum total of our experiences. These experiences, be they positive or negative, make us the person we are at any given point in our lives. And, like a flowing river, those same experiences, and those yet to come, continue to influence and reshape the person we are and the person we become. None of us are the same as we were yesterday, nor will be tomorrow. Over time, though, behaviorism began to lose favor as it appeared to oversimplify matters. In a strict behaviorist view of psychology, there's no room for our thought processes or our internal experiences. What happens when someone plans out an action? What happens when we imagine something happening? What about intention? Cognitive psychology added this element and looked at the brain more like a computer with a program running. The program is our thought process and we use this to decide what to do and how we're going to do it. CBT, meanwhile, elegantly combines both these approaches into one unified theory. We still learn through association, but this can just as easily occur within our own heads. If you're convinced you're going to fall off a height, then you'll keep rehearsing it happening in your mind and you'll keep thinking to yourself that you're going to fall. This alone is enough to create the association and to make us afraid of heights. So to treat a phobia, CBT will focus on reconditioning and creating new associations. But it does this both physically and through changes to your internal monologue. So it combines the two theories. So how does CBT work? Well, this is where mindfulness comes in. Now, let's say you're afraid of public speaking and you want to try and get rid of that phobia forever. The first thing you would do is to be more mindful and to listen to your own thoughts and reflect on them. This should rob them of their power as you become detached and aloof from those thoughts. And part of the process is through journaling. And this involves writing down your feelings as they come to you or writing them down in a journal at the end of the day. So you can actually physically see them on the page. So they are actually now detached from you. You're writing them down, you're getting them out, and then you're reading them back. But because you're looking at it on a page, you're looking at it on a piece of paper, you can actually think of it as being separate from you. It's not the voice in your head anymore. It's what's written down on the page. The next steps all fall under the category of cognitive restructuring. And you can think this as reprogramming yourself or reprogramming the computer that is your brain. And the first part of this involves thought challenging. And in this, you're looking at those thoughts that you made a note of, and now you're challenging them and testing whether or not you really think they're true. So if you're afraid of public speaking, it may be that you think things like, I'm going to stutter and everyone will laugh at me. In thought challenging, we're going to deconstruct that belief to see if it really is likely or if it's anything to be afraid of. So ask yourself, why would you stutter? Do you normally stutter when you talk? Why would people laugh at you? Are people usually that unkind? Would you laugh if someone had a hard time giving a speech? Or would you be more sympathetic and understanding than that? Does it matter? You aren't going to see these people again, so why does it matter what they think of you? You can even repeat a mantra to yourself as a positive affirmation. You know, something like, it doesn't really matter what these people think of me. It doesn't really matter what these people think of me. Over and over again in your mind. Then we move on to hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is one of the most unpleasant and upsetting treatments that are part of CBT, but it's also by far one of the most immediately effective. The idea is that you're looking at those fears that you have, and then you're going to test if they're true. So if you're afraid of public speaking, you're going to go out and give a speech to a room full of strangers. The larger the gathering, the better. And you're going to face that fear head on. And guess what? 
nine out of ten times you'll find your imagination was worse than the reality. Most people will just wait politely because, well, that's what people do. Either that, or they will laugh at you. But so what? You're not going to see them again, so it won't really matter. And finally, there's exposure therapy. This is the final part of CBT. And in exposure therapy, you're going to face your fear repeatedly until it gets desensitized. So, in the case of a phobia of public speaking, this might mean attending classes to become a stand-up comedian. So you end up speaking publicly all the time. Scary. Okay, let's talk about becoming more present. And when I say more present, I mean more in the moment, more in the here and now. This is something that animals do. This is something that kids do. But it's something that we seem to grow out of during our teenage years. Now, how can you do this? How can you become more present? Well, one method is to start focusing on your body and on your senses a little bit more. The sad truth is that most of us are so in our own heads that we barely notice half of what's going on around us. We walk in a dream state, worrying about work or about our relationships, and we hardly take the time to stop and smell the roses, either literally or metaphorically. So try this right now. Pause this video and just start to notice the sounds around you. And I mean, really listen. Okay, just hit the pause button right now and listen for a few minutes and then come back and hit the play button again. Please do this for me right now. Okay, what did you hear? Well, if you're in a town or a city, there's a good chance that you heard traffic rumbling by on the street, you know, car horn sounding, maybe a police siren. You probably uh, heard tires squealing, rumbling, that sort of thing. If you're doing this at work, if you're in an office, then you'll probably hear you know, a hum of conversation in the background. You might hear phones ringing. You'll hear the sound of people clicking their fingers on a keyboard and on a computer and that sort of thing. Uh, you'll probably hear doors opening and closing. Maybe the hum of the air conditioning if you're in an air conditioned office, that sort of thing. If you're doing this at home and your home is attached to another one, say you live in an apartment or a terraced house or a row house as they're called in some places, then you might hear sounds coming from next door. Or if there are other people at home with you, you might hear noises coming from another room. So you might hear the TV or you might hear the radio or people talking or a baby crying. You may well hear a clock ticking, that sort of thing. Or if you've got a window open or if you're outdoors, then you may hear a bird singing or chirping or a pigeon cooing or something like that. All sorts of things that you might not have noticed before. And you could probably smell a whole load of things that you hadn't noticed too. And if you took a moment to feel your own body, you probably noticed the sensation of the seat pushing into your legs and into your buttocks. Maybe you could feel the blood filling your face and making you feel hot. Now, listen to the sound of your own breathing and feel your abdomen expand and shrink as you do so. Try doing this when you're outside. You'll certainly notice the wind. You know, what direction is it blowing? What smells are being blown in? Doing this when you're walking down the street in a town or city is something else you'll be amazed at what you notice. You know, different designs in the architecture of the buildings, shop window displays, cars and street furniture. Even if you've walked this same street for years, you're bound to notice something different, yet something that you haven't seen before. You'll overhear snippets of conversations, especially from people who are talking on their phones. You'll feel the hard surface of the pavement or sidewalk, and you'll really feel connected with the here and now. In the country, you'll notice the fresh wind on your face. You'll smell the flowers and the plants. You'll hear the birds singing and so much more. 
Once you do all this, you'll find that you stop worrying about what's going on in your life and you'll start to appreciate the here and now a little more. You know, there's so much that you normally miss. Another way to use this is to be more present in conversation, using these techniques in conversation. And when you turn off the internal monologue and really listen to what the other person is saying, you'll find that your relationships improve tremendously. Friendships will become deeper because everyone appreciates a good listener. Not just that, but when you take the time to pay attention to people's body language and the tone and inflection of their voice, you'll easily be able to figure out what they're really saying, which isn't always expressed in words. And this can apply to every conversation, in business, with your spouse, with your kids, with neighbours, you know, every time you talk to someone. And this is what so many of us don't do. So many of us are constantly in a dream state and worrying about other things that we actually miss what's going on around us. So turn off the internal chatter and tune into what's really happening. In this video, I want to talk about flow states. Now, what are flow states? Well, in a flow state, you're so engaged with the surroundings and what's happening that you forget yourself entirely. Oh, sound familiar? It's almost like a form of meditation, except this time you're completely switched onto the world around you. And this is something that most of us have experienced at some time in our lives, and you may be familiar with it if you think back. For example, have you ever been in a running race or some other type of sport where you're so focused on what's going on that you completely lose track of where you are, that you don't really think of anything at all other than getting across that finish line and getting across that finish line in front of everybody else. You, know, you don't even realize when you're running down the street exactly where you are uh, on the route. If you ever run a marathon on a street circuit, you might not realize exactly where you are because you're so focused on the activity that you're engaging in that you're actually running the race that you really lose track of exactly where you are. Or have you been writing something and you've got so involved in the actual writing process that you completely lose track of time? You know, like the girl in this picture here, she's writing away and she's so focused that she hasn't realized that her tea's gone cold. When she comes to take a sip of it, it's stone cold because she's got so involved in the writing process that she's just completely lost track of time. Or have you had a conversation that's lasted all night? You've just sat up talking and talking and talking and you didn't realize it. And then before you know it, dawn's breaking and uh, you realize that you've been up all night talking, but you don't feel tired because you're so involved in the process. Or have you been watching a box set on TV? You know, you've bought the box set of DVDs and you've watched the first one and you've got so involved, you think, OK, yeah, let's have another one. And you just simply watch one after another, after another, after another. And then before you realize it, it's, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning and you started watching all these uh, TV program box sets, you know, in the afternoon. So you just got so involved, you're so concentrated on what's going on. And this is a lot like action meditation, and it's thought to be at the heart of most of our scientific breakthroughs, most record-breaking athletic accomplishments, and all kinds of other examples of people acting their very best. So how do flow states work, and how do they fit in with how the rest of the human brain works? Well, basically, a flow state is very similar to the fight-or-flight response, but with less negativity, you could say. And it means that you think what's happening around you is very important and deserves all of your attention. As a result, your body starts to produce dopamine and other neurotransmitters. And this causes your brain to become intensely focused, which creates the illusion that time has slowed down. And you gain a kind of tunnel vision. And now the only thing that you're focused on is that one moment and the things that you have to do to emerge from it victorious. 
So how can you train your brain to enter flow states at will? Well, first of all, relax. Take a few deep breaths and set your mind to your task. Concentrate on just one task at a time. Turn off your internal monologue and ignore distractions as much as possible. And many people find it useful to engage in some sort of ritual at this point to remind your brain that you want to enter a flow state. So you could clap your hands, for example. Then focus all your attention on the present moment. You know, don't think about the past or the future. The task at hand is what matters and nothing else. And then slowly set about your task. You know, treat it like an action meditation exercise. If you find your mind starts to wander, then bring it back into focus by shutting out any chatter. And challenge yourself to stay focused for as long as possible. And with practice, you'll find that you can turn a flow state on at will. So start with something simple. You know, brushing your teeth is a good example. And then move on to more complicated tasks like cooking a meal. Now, don't expect too much too soon because it does take some time to actually master this. But in this video, I want to talk about how you deal with panic attacks. Now, just about everyone experiences some level of anxiety at some point in their lives. You know, it's perfectly normal and perfectly natural. But panic attacks are different. Panic attacks can make you feel like you're out of control. Panic attacks are typically unexpected, intense bursts of fear and anxiety. And you may feel like you're losing control and, even more worryingly, you fear that you'll be unable to avoid future attacks, which makes you even more anxious. And panic attacks can also have physical symptoms too, including shaking, feeling disorientated, nausea, rapid irregular heartbeats, dry mouth, trembling, feeling like you're choking, breathlessness, sweating and dizziness. The symptoms of a panic attack are not dangerous, but they can be very frightening and they can be exceedingly unpleasant. And you might even think that you're having a heart attack and are about to collapse and die. Most panic attacks last somewhere from five minutes to half an hour. Generally, they're not fatal, but they can be very nasty and debilitating. And they can come on without warning and leave you fearful of having another attack. So, if you find yourself having a panic attack, the first thing to do is, well, don't panic. Now, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you start panicking and hyperventilating, you're only going to make things worse. So you want to remain as mindful and in the moment as possible. Tell yourself that you're having a panic attack and it will pass. You want to breathe in deeply and calmly through your nose and then breathe out slowly through your mouth. Count steadily from one to five with each in and out breath. So, you know, in one, two, three, four, five, out, one, two, three, four, five, in, one, two, three, four, five, out, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And you want to close your eyes and focus on your breathing. Panic attacks are a reaction to the fight or flight mechanism that we inherited from our caveman ancestors. So it is a bit of a hangover to a previous time. And in the caveman days, our caveman ancestors would either fight the woolly mammoth uh, or they would run away from the saber-toothed tiger, usually the latter. That's where a lot of panic attacks come from. It's fear, fear of uh, imminent danger or imminent perceived danger. So even though it is the fight or flight mechanism, nevertheless, it's best not to completely remove yourself from the situation that's caused the panic attack. You want to stand your ground and fight your fears. 
Unless, of course, the situation is obviously a dangerous one. So if you're having a panic attack because your house is on fire, then obviously you want to get out as quickly as possible. After a while, the attack will subside and you'll begin thinking rationally again. So allow yourself to assess the situation because, as the old saying goes, what our minds perceive, we believe. So when we can assess the situation rationally, often we can see that there was nothing to be afraid of in the first place and this can help prevent a panic attack from reoccurring. You also want to look for patterns and triggers and you want to consider lifestyle changes if necessary. So, for example, if you find that you're having a lot of panic attacks at work and you work for a really aggressive, shouty boss like this guy on the left, then, well, perhaps it might be time to look for a new job. How can you go about preventing panic attacks? Well, apart from avoiding stressful situations, Cutting down on stimulants such as caffeine, alcohol and tobacco can help. So, you know, it's a good time to quit smoking if you find that you're getting lots of panic attacks. Cognitive behavioural therapy, otherwise known as CBT, can also help. Now, this is a psychological treatment that reprograms your brain and helps to avoid future panic attacks. Your doctor or other healthcare professionals should be able to advise you on this. If you feel constantly stressed and anxious, particularly about when your next panic attack may be, you may be suffering from panic disorder. People with panic disorder often avoid situations that could cause a panic attack. Often, they develop a fear of going outside the safety of their home, technically known as agoraphobia, and they avoid public spaces and tend to become isolated and withdrawn. This often increases anxiety levels and increases the chances of having a panic attack when they do go out, and so in some ways it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Again, if you feel that you may be suffering from panic disorder, you should speak to your doctor without delay. Now, What if you're with someone who's having a panic attack? What should you do? Well, first of all, you want to stay calm. Reassure the person that they are having a panic attack and that it will pass. If they have medication to deal with panic attacks, offer to go and get it. Otherwise, stay with the person until the attack is over and encourage the person to breathe deeply and calmly, you know, the same technique that I explained at the beginning of this video. When the attack is over, then help them recover. Get them a chair, offer them a glass of water, that sort of thing. If the panic attack is not a one-off, then you should encourage the person. A great way to help reduce stress and anxiety in your life is to have a morning routine that can help you face the day and to ease yourself into whatever it is that you're going to be doing during the day. And a morning routine lets you stop being reactive and start being proactive. And it means that you're now setting the pace and deciding how you want to begin your day. And it can help to make you more productive and efficient for the entire day that follows. So, what might a morning routine look like? Well, first of all, you want to get up at a regular time. Get up at a regular time every day, even at the weekends. Preferably, this should be after daybreak. I know that's easy to do in the summer, in the winter time, particularly if you live uh, in the extreme north or the extreme south. uh, That can be a problem, but preferably after daybreak. And... If you are having to get up before dawn, then you might want to invest in one of these lamps or alarm clocks that will gradually light your bedroom so that uh, you have the illusion of it being after daybreak. And you want to spend a few minutes to fully wake up before you actually get up. So don't hear the alarm, reach over, switch it off, drag yourself out of bed straight away and you're still mainly asleep by the time you stagger to the bathroom. You you just want to just lie there for a few moments to fully wake up before you actually get up. And you want to use this time to reflect on what you want to accomplish during the day ahead. Then you should take a shower. 
take a cold shower if you can stand it. Uh, although it doesn't have to be. But if you can, you'll find that it invigorates you, wakes you up and really helps you to focus and feel your own body. Then you want to have a healthy breakfast uh, with family if possible. And this will help you to connect with others and will reduce stress levels. And it's best if you sit down at the breakfast table and eat it like a proper meal. Don't rush it. Take your time. Plan your get-up time so that you have enough time to do this every day. And if you're going to drink a lot of coffee at work, because coffee can be stress-inducing, then have tea or fruit juice instead with your breakfast. You should also read the morning paper. You know, catch up on the news in a way that doesn't require the TV. Alternatively, you can listen to the radio. You know, a news talk station is a great way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. If nothing else, the travel news and the weather forecast are likely to be more up to the minute than they are on TV. Then you should write a to-do list. When you do this, well, now you're taking control of how you're going to spend your day instead of just going with the flow. Something else is no emails, phones or computers until you get to work. And this will prevent you from getting overstimulated before you've had a chance to fully wake up. Then you want to get some exercise. Now, even a short walk is better than nothing. If you drive to work, then go for a walk around the block before you set off. Um, provided, of course, that you live in a safe neighbourhood where you can do that. Now, if you use public transport, then get off one stop early and walk the rest of the way. Again, provided that it's safe to do so. And you also want to vary your route to work. And there's two reasons why you want to do this. First of all, it breaks up the monotony because you find that you do the same thing all the time. You're pretty much on autopilot. You're not engaging your brain and you want to engage your brain. So you want to break up the monotony by doing something slightly different. And of course, it makes your morning interesting because you're going to see something different all the time on your way to work. And you want to be mindful when you do all this. You want to take in what's going on around you. Don't think about what you're going to be doing during the day. That's what your to-do list is for. But while you're on your way to work, while you're on your journey, you just want to take in what's going on and tune into the moment. Finally, do all that you can to reduce stress. That way, you'll start work refreshed and ready to put in Getting rid of stress at the end of the day can be very difficult and it can lead to insomnia and all sorts of other problems. So in this video, I want to talk you through a typical evening routine that can help you wind down. The first part of your evening routine should be to turn off electronic devices. In our modern age, people love their electronic equipment, whether it's a TV, a computer, tablet, mobile phone, games console, you know, they take up a lot of our time. However, it's not a good idea to use them during the 30 minutes before going to sleep for several reasons. First of all, they stimulate your brain. So they keep your brain active at the time when you want to be slowing down so that you can go to sleep. And the light that's emitted from some devices can interfere with your internal body clock. So you really want to be getting darker rather than lighter as your uh, evening wears on. And of course, they can be addictive, eating into even more sleep time. If you have your cell phone with you or you have your tablet or you have your laptop and you're checking work emails last thing at night, then that can create worry and stress because you're going to have work on your mind at the time when you should be winding down and going to sleep. And doing away with these things will help to get your brain ready for sleep and will increase your production of the sleep hormone melatonin, making it easier for you to enter a restful sleep. 
Something else you can do is to write a journal. You know, writing a journal is a great way to reflect on the day and how it could have been better, or is a great way of reflecting on what you enjoyed about it. And this will help put the events of the day in perspective, and it will help to declutter your mind. And you should write it out on paper in longhand. Don't use a computer, laptop, or tablet. Physically writing out your journal will help your brain connect with the events of the day and to remember it more. And as previously mentioned, the light some devices emit can interfere with your internal body clock. You also want to practice meditation and mindfulness. Theravada meditation, in particular, can be very useful in helping you to enter a relaxed state of mind. Something else you can do is to lay out your clothes or your gym kit for tomorrow. So, if you go for a workout first thing in the morning, then put your gym kit out. Otherwise, decide what clothes that you're going to wear the day beforehand.、Um, this acts as a link to the day that's to come, and it also means that first thing in the morning, you're not going to have to think, "Oh gosh, what am I going to wear today?" Because it's already done there for you. All you got to do is put it on. Then you also want to hang up the clothes that you wore today, or you want to put them in the laundry basket. And this mentally helps to signify that the day is at an end. You should also have a warm bath, and this can help relax the muscles for better sleep. Using bath salts or essential oils can also help your body relax. You can also listen to some relaxing music, you know, something that can induce pleasant thoughts and help you to relax. Now, what music you choose will depend a lot on your musical taste. But soothing classical music or jazz is probably preferable to something lively like hip hop or heavy metal. And you can also read in bed. Now, this helps you to feel sleepier and is also very meditative. Your choice of reading material is up to you, but it should be something that you find interesting. Although. Is not so engrossing that you enter a flow state and stay up reading all night. So something that you're interested in, something that can you know make your mind relax and just sort of help you ease into sleep. Now, for reasons previously mentioned, it's best to read a physical book or magazine instead of a tablet or an e-reader. And don't worry too much. If you don't fall asleep right away, you know it could be that you're just not ready to fall asleep. Try practicing some mindfulness or Theravada meditation to help your mind relax. But if you're still awake after thirty minutes, then get up, go into another room, and try reading, meditating, or listening to music. However, you should avoid anything stimulating like watching TV. Playing video games or surfing the net, though, and when you do all this, you'll find you should have no trouble dropping off, going to sleep. In this video, I want to tell you how to stop being a zombie, and for the purposes of clarification about that last statement, I'm not talking about being one of the undead. But so many of us go through our lives on autopilot that we might as well be brain dead. You know. Think about it for a moment. You probably take the same route to work every day. You take the same ride on the same bus. You have the same breakfast. You have the same conversation with the same people. You perform the same tasks throughout your working day. You get home at the same time and you sit in the same place. Am I right? Well. If I am right, I'm afraid you're not alone because lots of people do this, and they find that their whole lives are run on autopilot.、Uh, they don't need to wear a watch because they do the same thing at the same time every single day. And some people go even further than that list of、uh, things I just mentioned. Yeah, you know, they'll have the same thing for lunch every day.、Uh, they might wear the same type of clothing every day.、Uh, okay, if you wear a uniform to work, you don't have any choice in it. But sometimes people wear the same sort of clothing. Every day, and it's the same thing over and over again. And sometimes it's done for convenience because you don't have to make the same decision over and over again. But really, that's while that has that advantage, it's also 
a, a big disadvantage because your brain is actually set up to make decisions. So if you're not using it to make decisions, part of it just simply switches off. So how can you change this? How can you make your life more interesting so that you're not a zombie going around on autopilot? Well, first of all, try taking a different route to and from work. Now, if you've worked at the same place for a long time, you probably have your route down to a T, you know what time you're going to leave, you know how bad the traffic's going to be, and you know what time you're going to get there and so on. So what you could do if you don't want to be late for work is perhaps have a different route home from work. So obviously the time isn't quite so pressing then. But a lot of people will use a sat-nav or GPS to uh, plan a route. And that's what everybody does. But personally, I find a good way to plan different routes is to use Google Earth. If you log on to Google Earth, either as the standalone app or as the part of Google Maps, you can look at your route, you can look at your neighborhood, you can see all sorts of back streets that you might not know about, and you can plan a route from that and you know, give yourself plenty of time. But it does make life more interesting because you can see different things on your route to and from work. Alternatively, where it's practical, take public transport instead of driving your car. And when you do this, it has another advantage in so far as you're going to be surrounded by other people all the time. Now, if you drive to work on your own, you can get very isolated. And being around other people as part of public transport can be quite stimulating. Even if you don't talk to them or interact with them, you can still uh, just physically being around other people can have an effect on your brain. Another thing that you can do is to try different types of food. You know, eat out more often if you can afford it and try a different type of cuisine. So if you've been past, you know, say, um, a Korean restaurant and you've never been in and you don't know what Korean food tastes like, well, book a table and have a meal there and then you'll know and you can try these different types of food. And you might like it or you might not, but at least you'll know what it's like, and it'll be something else that you can add to your list of life experiences. Something else that you can do is to join a club or an organization. Now, this is great because you'll meet new people, first of all, people that you don't know before, and you'll get to socialize with like-minded individuals who are nothing to do with your work. You know, so many people, their work life and their social life is exactly the same. And so you meet the same people all the time. And you don't really have a life outside work. And that can get very boring. So if you join a club or organization, you'll get to socialize with people who are nothing to do with your work and can bring something else to your life. Also, you could buy a CD or a download from a band that you've never heard before. You know, just pick one at random and see what they sound like or from a different musical genre to the one that you always listen to. You know, lots of people listen to the same music all the time, same type of music. But if you, you know, if you generally listen to rock music, try listening to jazz or classical music. It's different, but you might like it, you might not, but at least you'll be exposing your brain to some different type of stimulation. Something else to do is to go somewhere that you've never been before just to see what it's like. And you don't have to travel far to broaden your horizons. That street that you drive past the top of every day? Well, why don't you turn down it next time just to see where it goes? In all these things, try to be mindful and live in the moment. And when you do, your brain will light up and come alive and you'll get a reprieve from your stresses and problems. Better yet, you'll form new neural connections, which will once again help you to become sharper, smarter, faster and more creative and more alive. In this video, I want to talk about Kaizen. And when you use Kaizen, it means lots of small changes to get really big results. Now, Kaizen is a term from Japan and it's Japanese for improvement.
When used in the business sense and applied to the workplace. Kaizen refers to activities that continuously improve all functions and involve all employees, from the CEO to the assembly line workers. And it also applies to processes such as purchasing and logistics that cross organizational boundaries into the supply chain. It has been applied in healthcare, psychotherapy, life coaching, government, banking, and other industries. And the cycle of kaizen activity can be defined like this: plan, do, check, act, and then one could also add rinse and repeat. This is also known as the Schuhart cycle, the Deming cycle, or PDCA. And basically, it means that、um, what you have are well. There's basically two cycles to all this. The first cycle is plan, do, check, and act. While the second cycle is a subset of the do part, containing problem finding, display, clear, and acknowledge. And these are part of the Kaizen method of quality control, and it's also used in what's come to known as the Toyota way. Now. The Toyota Way or the Toyota production system is well known for kaizen, and this is where all line personnel are expected to stop their moving production line in case of any abnormality, and along with their supervisor, suggest an improvement to resolve the anomaly, which may initiate a kaizen. So when something goes wrong, everybody stops. They all get together, solve the problem, and then they start up again using the new method. And it's a continuous improvement. If somebody can think of a better way of doing something, they test the hypothesis and then they act on it. And it's you know it's not like in a lot of companies where the boss tells you what to do and you do it, even though you might be able to see a better way. And the boss says no, 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 shut up and do as you're told. You know that that's not the way that they do it. And of course, it obviously works better because Toyota is a very very successful company. So, how can you implement Kaizen into your life? Well, there are a few ways that you can do this. One thing that you could do is cut out the coffee that you buy on your way to work in order to save more money. I mean, I don't know how much、um, a cup of coffee costs from a coffee shop where you live, but it's generally a great deal more expensive than it is making your own coffee. So, cut out the coffee you buy on your way to work. Save the money, and then you can put that savings towards the cost of your next holiday or the deposit on a new car. And it's just a little bit of money put aside every day, but by this time next year, your next holiday could be paid for. So effectively, your holidays cost nothing. That sort of thing. Something else that you can do is go to bed ten minutes earlier. Now, ten minutes is nothing, but it's over an hour's more sleep every week, or How about investing in a robotic lawnmower? Now it's a small thing for sure, but it makes a big difference when it means that your lawn always looks tidy and you never have to waste time mowing it. Something else that you can do if you're a creative person and you write things, then writing your next book one chapter at a time, or even you know a thousand words at a time. And some of the greatest works of literature have been published this way. For example, many of Charles Dickens' novels, and in particular some of his early works, were actually published originally as articles in Strand magazine. And once you start to implement kaizen into your life, it becomes a virtual circle 